welcome everybody. Um, it's it's wonderful to to see you all. We've got forty people uh, in the room uh, now, and I think we will have more joining uh, as in in the next couple of minutes. Um, it's uh, you know good. It's a beautiful autumn, late morning, eleven a.m. in in Canberra. Um, let me begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians um, on whose traditional lands. The Australian National University operates. Uh, we pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, um, uh, their elders past, present and emergent. Um, welcome to this, the fourth um, event of the Women in Asia Pacific Security Research Seminar Series um, based out of the Korobel School at the ANU. Uh, we're absolutely delighted that we uh, made it the star in the series. We began last November and um, I am particularly pleased today that we will be uh, running our second flagship um, webinar roundtable involving three fantastic speakers. Um, all the lights have just gone off behind me because we have an ecologically sound building where the lights go off if you don't move. Um, our <laughs> in, in today's um, roundtable, we're going to address the second part of the what's so special about Asian security theme. And today we're going to be talking about dealing with non-traditional security and non-state actors in Asian security. Um, in the first of these roundtables uh, back in November, we talked about the economic security nexus. So this is part two on non-state actors and non-traditional security. Um, please let me begin by taking a few minutes to introduce you to our three fantastic speakers, um, whom I'm very grateful have agreed uh, to, to talk to us today. We're going to kick off with um, Helen Nassajirai. Helen, do wave. Um, <laughs> um, who is Professor of International Political Economy at Monash um, University, Malaysia. So Helen is joining us from Kuala Lumpur. Um, welcome, Helen. Uh, she will be a familiar name to those of you who work in uh, areas of uh, regional institutions and international political economy of Southeast Asia. Helen's very well known for her work on ASEAN um, and uh, regional integration and governance. Uh, more recently, she's pivoted her research uh, towards transnational go governance as a new mode of authority in world politics. And I think in her remarks today, uh, she will be alluding to her new body of work on private standards for sustainable palm oil and other such um, industries particularly. So we're looking forward to hearing from Helen. Um, after, after Helen's delivered a uh, you know, a series of short remarks shall be followed by our second speaker, uh, Lorraine Elliott. Um, Lorraine is, is uh, uh, my colleague here at the ANU. Uh, she's Professor Emerita in International Relations here at the Corabel School. We're very, very pleased that um, you could join us and, and speak to speak today, Lorraine. Um, Lorraine's research focuses on global governance and human security, also on transnational environmental crime and regional environmental governance in Southeast Asia as well. So Lorraine really works at that nexus of environmental security, climate security, and human security. Um, uh, she has had a very long and very distinguished academic and engagement, international policy engagement record. And just a couple of highlights, um, Lorraine chaired the International Board of the Academic Council on the UN system uh, between 2015 and 2018. Um, she is uh, also a member of the network of experts for the global initiative against transnational organized crime. And in, in what she's going to uh, briefly speak to us about today, she will be drawing from these areas of expertise and, and, and the work that she's done um, in, in these topics and themes. Um, Last but not least, our, our third speaker is uh, Pichamon Yofantong. Wave, Pichamon. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> um, uh, Pichamon is senior lecturer um, here at the uh, School of Humanities and Social Sciences in UNSW Canberra. Um, 
where Pichmon is also an Australian Research Council DECRA fellow working on a project on how to improve regulation of uh, Chinese resource and infrastructure investment overseas. So as you can imagine, there's an enormous demand on Pichamon's time and expertise these days. Um, she is a political scientist um, and a China specialist, and her broader research focuses on Chinese foreign policy and the political economy of sustainable development in the Asia Pacific more broadly. Um, so again, Pichmon will be drawing on these areas of expertise in, in her remarks today. So having introduced you very briefly to these three wonderful um, women scholars, um, I'll turn over to them. They'll each speak for about 10 minutes and then we'd really like to open up this round table to a conversation amongst them and also with uh, the rest of the audience as well. Um, just a reminder that as they're speaking, um, it would be great if the rest of us could mute our mics at least um, to improve the sound quality. And if you've got questions or comments as they go along, please feel free to pop those into the chat box. Um, indeed, it would be really helpful if you pop, could pop a short version of your question into the chat box so that we can make sure that the discussion and the questions uh, um, lined up in, in as efficient a manner as possible when we come to that segment of today's proceedings. So Helen, I'm very happy to turn over, no, yes, that's right, Helen's going first. Turn over to Helen at this point, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Evelyn. Um, so uh, for, the, for those very generous uh, remarks, I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, what I will do today uh, is just to use the notion of uh, economic security as a way to talk about how to deal with non-state actors in research more broadly. And I will draw, as you have said, on some work I've done on non-state actors and the transnational governance of sustainability, particularly in agricultural commodities, but as a way to discuss this broader issue. And I guess what I will be suggesting is that non-state actors have made the path to economic security far more complex for Southeast Asian states. So access to the global economy remains uh, you know, central to the economic security of Southeast Asian states. For these states, uh, economic security is one dimension of uh, comprehensive security, emphasizing, among other things, reliable and stable access to markets, especially for outputs from sectors designated as strategically important. Despite markets remaining broadly open, uh, you find that access to markets is becoming increasingly conditional on meeting social and environmental standards of production, for instance, on deforestation, labor standards, forced labor, and, and uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and so on. And these standards include those established by uh, national policy or legislation in developed countries, notably in Europe and the US. And they also include the voluntary standards put in place by non-state actors, both not-for-profit actors and corporate actors, that in some instances are used by public authorities as benchmarks in uh, determining market access. So this poses a significant challenge for those parts of the Southeast Asian political economy rooted in the exploitation of labor, land, and nature. Now, linking trade to environmental and labor standards is not new. What has changed, I think, is the extent to which economic production, which increasingly takes place in global supply chains, is, is becoming more complex as a result of the actions of non-state actors intersecting with gov uh, government actions to embed uh, what I call ethical markets in sectors of relevance to Southeast Asia. There are a few elements to this complexity that I would like to highlight. One is the structural uh, architecture, if you will. There are a diverse, often competing array of public and private social and environmental standards that are reshaping, albeit unevenly, uh, they're reshaping global supply chains in key commodities and the market access problems occur when these supply chains touch down in those markets demanding these ethical production standards. 
Two, we see cross-cutting demands to improve social and environmental practices in production and consumption coming from many sources and many levels, such as state authorities, especially in developed countries, supply chain actors, transnational nonprofit and civic organizations, you've got consumer sentiment and of late financial markets. And three, the multi-way interaction of these different demands and pressures to abide by these ethical standards can leave targeted economic actors and their governments caught off guard. But the thing is, such pressures are not a recent development. They've been in the making for over two decades, but they were uneven, diffuse, and mostly emanated from NGOs. And so they were easier to miss or misinterpret or dismiss until their combined interactive effects became visible and significant, especially when developed countries started to act on them. Let me just highlight a few recent examples of these challenges to market access. In 2020 and 2021, uh, the first few months of this year, the US Customs and Border Protection withheld the release of rubber gloves and palm oil produced by major companies in Malaysia that had arrived in the uh, US ports on grounds that their production involved forced labor. NGO reports and documentation had been instrumental in the Customs and Border Protection issuing these withhold release orders. But there are some questions, for instance, about the veracity of this information, but the Customs and Border Protection is legally able to act on evidence regarded as reasonable rather than conclusive. In any case, uh, there were knock-on effects when other manufacturers outside the US, in Europe, in Australia and Japan blocked, for instance, palm oil from these affected companies entering their own production operations because they didn't want to be associated with tainted palm oil. Uh, going back a little bit, developments in the European Union since 2018, again, building on the work of NGOs, advocacy, surveillance, and their activities in the development of soft law standards, will see palm oil singled out uh, for exclusion as a sustainable biofuel in the US, uh, sorry, in the EU. And then you have the EU's 2020 farm to fork strategy, which likewise extends ethical production standards to weed out food items linked to deforestation and other environmental ills from European consumer markets. So we see a layering of different social and environmental standards and the actions of various actors coming together to embed these ethical markets within various supply chains. And what are the implications of such dynamics for how we deal with non-state actors in research? I think the primary point is that in some areas uh, of interest to us of research, we, we have to move away from the idea of discrete states interacting linearly with other states over market access or of states being lobbied by non-state actors to change their production practices, as was common in the 1990s and 2000s. Now, other scholars have made this call, for instance, uh, Fiona Adamson to move beyond methodological nationalism, or by Farrell and Newman to move beyond examining dyads of states to looking at economic networks when studying the weaponization of economic interdependence. So first, I think our analytical frameworks need to incorporate states as one among many actors interacting within social spaces that transcend state boundaries and in which varying permutations of authority may be exercised in several interlinked ways, uh, hierarchically through state diplomatic or legislative or regulatory actions, through the market power of economic actors operating in and through global production networks or supply chains, and latterly financial markets, and especially through the information, the knowledge, and the discursive capabilities that empower transnational uh, non-state actors, uh, NGOs, uh, and activists in their advocacy, in surveillance work, and also in their soft law activities. And then you add the impact of the media and uh, of social media and the internet, and you get a complex, often unfamiliar terrain for states and producers operating in Southeast Asia. So going further, looking beyond methodological uh, nationalism means exploring the architecture uh, and the processes of post-national or non-national spaces, because this is where non-state actors can thrive, uh, depending on how these sites or spaces have been structured or institutionalized, which can facilitate, empower, or constrain them in their activities. So there are various concepts and tools we can employ to capture some of this network analysis, or we can draw on economic geography models of 
global production networks or commodity chains or value chains. Then there's also the interesting concept of assemblages used by scholars to study, for instance, global governance or financial markets or piracy of the Somalia coast. Um, assemblages are not as coherent or as structured as networks of supply chain. They are far looser with fluid boundaries. They have disparate elements or actors who act in line with their respective purposes that don't necessarily have to work in coordinated ways, but it's their parallel interactions that come together in unexpected ways. And so this may be harder to predict and easier to ignore or dismiss in their earlier stages, but which can often leave disproportionate um, effects. Um, I, I would like to just end with an observation about policy implications. Um, the global supply chains of importance to the Southeast Asian political economy in agricultural commodities, food products, in fisheries, manufacturing items such as gloves, garments, footwear, these are already facing demands and pressures to conform to ethical production standards. And as I've said, the supply chains are becoming highly interconnected and complex systems. To my mind, I find that government responses tend to combine more rhetorical and tactical actions. So tactical moves to redirect exports to internal markets or to less demanding external markets. But I don't think these can be permanent solutions. Uh, and, and complex systems are noted for being hard to predict and they require, I think, more strategic and longer term action that recognizes that the Southeast Asian political economy is connected to both more and less ethically demanding markets, but these are themselves in dynamic processes of change. So I guess in such situations, um, perhaps, you know, this is something that I've kind of looked at, but not in any depth. Uh, the, the climate change literature and the security governance literature point us towards the notion of resilience as a way of managing complexity and what resilience might mean in situations such as those I have described, perhaps maybe a useful line of research more broadly to see how to build adaptive capacities for economic security that also address the uh, social and environmental harms that we see uh, all around us um, in the region. Uh, I think I'll stop there, Evelyn. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, that was really, really efficient. And you, uh, you, you gave us tons and tons to think about in, in that very short space of time. And in, in, in also a very useful sort of three-step uh, framework, I think. And I just, you know, put, put on the table here as a sort of marker first before we sort of bring in the other two speakers, the notions of, you know, ethical demands in, in, in ethical markets uh, on the rise across a series of uh, production sectors um, and industries indeed. Um, the cross-cutting and multi-way interaction of these differential um, regulatory norms, if we, if we put it that way, um, that range, you know, from things like demands for, you know, um, sustainability of certain products to demands for proof that they are forced labor free, um, deforestation free, etc. So we're really talking about quite a wide range of, of products and industries here. And I also take away the point that you made that this is, you know, by no means, you know, a very new phenomenon, but one that is actually coming to a point, um, which is making it very difficult for broader audiences, transnational audiences to ignore. So this, this idea of coming to a certain sort of fruition in, in the systemic way. And finally, of course, you know, your policy implication point of the challenges on how to think about um, these rapidly developing networks or assemblages um, in a more strategic rather than a purely tactical or, or, or uh, uh, resource nationalistic sort of way, I think is, is a really good reminder of points that we may want to come back to in interaction with the other speakers and also in the question and answer. So thank you very much, Helen, for that um, uh, wonderful start to this. Thank you. Um, Lorraine, if, if it's good with you. Let, let's turn over to you for, for your 10 minutes. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you. And thank you very much for um, inviting me to be part of this uh, roundtable and panel. And, and I was struck as you were summarising uh, Helen's observations around a newness, around regulatory complexity, around those issues of ethical markets and even the policy implications, that in some ways there, there is actually an overlap with, uh, with the issues that I want to be talking about, which is uh, transnational environmental crime as a, a security issue in the region. Uh, and, and particularly, perhaps uh, just for the sake of convenience, I'm probably going to focus a little bit more on the illegal wildlife trade, but there's a range of other issues that we could be looking at. Timber trafficking, which often overlaps with that, the black market in ozone depleting substances, uh, fisheries crime, uh, illegal mining, which has a different dimension to it, but that's something that's become um, part of uh, a growing part of the agenda as well, uh, the trade in um, uh, toxic and, and hazardous waste. So, but I, uh, I thought I'd start with some, some data, if you like, and, and then what I want to do is move from that and say, well, how has this been understood as a security issue? And where do we actually find this engagement of the plethora of actors, to use the phrase that, that, uh, that uh, you, you introduced in, in the explanation for, for this panel? Uh, so, so the first thing, according to the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, wildlife and forest crime um, today is now one of the largest transnational organised criminal activities in um, East Asia and the Pacific region. Estimated to generate about just under 20 US billion dollars annually. Uh, that's about, uh, about a quarter of um, the approximately sort of 90 billion US dollars earned in a year by transnational organised crime. So it's quite a significant uh, component of that. The illegal harvesting and, and trafficking of timber alone is worth about 17 US billion um, dollars a year to, to criminal actors, and it's actually, this, that makes it the second highest um, value illicit commodity in the region after the illegal trade in counterfeit goods. Many people think that drugs is top, but are actually counterfeit goods. Uh, so that, that's the first. Um, I, I can go back to talk about some specific examples, but the numbers are actually quite, quite, uh, are quite significant in terms of individual species, for example that are trafficked in Southeast Asia and um, Asia and the Pacific more generally. Is a, it's both a source region, it's a transit region, and it's a, um, a market for illegal wildlife, for stolen timber that's actually trafficked, not just in the region, but actually um, to and from other parts of the world as well. And in the complexity of, of, of policy responses, the ASEAN um, Kuala Lumpur Declaration on Combating Transnational Crime 2015, which was the, the starting point for the most recent ASEAN, um, ASEAN plan, on, plan of Action on Combating Transnational Environmental Crime, did quite specifically include uh, uh, wildlife and forest crime under the heading of new non-traditional security threats. So in the region itself, there is very much that kind of connection. So the, the what I want to do then is, is, is go back and address three questions. How has this been securitized? What kinds of connections between transnational environmental crime, including illegal wildlife trade and security uh, can we understand as, as a non-traditional threat? So how does it link with other kinds of insecurities? And then I want to talk about two constellations of actors that are involved here. One is those that are involved in, in the space of illicit economy, illegality and criminality. So they are, if you like, um, nodes and purveyors of insecurity. And then I want to say something very briefly about the role of non-governmental actors uh, as, if you like, agents of security and particularly where those NGOs are involved in uh, the kinds of activities that we would normally think of as the bailiwick of the state in providing security. So I just want to in a way, I'm throwing out some, um, some of these ideas. In terms of, first, we can connect this more directly with uh, debates about the security of the state. Um, this kind of uh, illegal transboundary activity, these kinds of criminal endeavours, undermine state security because the state is simply unable to control transactions across what would otherwise seem to be um, either sovereign borders or in fact increasingly porous and increasingly insecure borders. So that's the, the first dimension. Um, security is undermined because particularly in border regions and, and border towns, the state is simply unable to govern. It, it is an, uh, unable to enforce its own laws. 
are the patterns of bribery and corruption that link the so-called underworld to the upper world and that involve agents of the state, sometimes as recipients of bribes, sometimes actually as um, as those who are actually actively engaged in these kinds of activities that underpin, say, timber trafficking uh, in particular. So it calls, it undermines good governance, it calls into question the credibility of the institutions of the state, the legitimacy, legitimacy of those uh, institutions, and it compromises core values such as the, the rule of law. Uh, the second area in which uh, transnational environmental crime is connected with uh, insecurity and the security or insecurity of the state is through its co connections with conflict and also connections with threat, threat finance. Globally, there's, um, uh, there's a debate about the extent to which um, um, militia groups, terror groups, etc., are actually benefiting from the illegal wildlife trade and timber trafficking. I have to say that um, the data is very hearsay, it's very uncertain. So despite articles such as poaching for bin Laden, the data is actually um, rather contested. Uh, and in fact, Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific, South Asia a little bit different, but Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific, much less evidence uh, that, that terror groups are using this kind of activity. But nevertheless, that whole issue of conflict and threat finance, and we do know that illegal extraction of resources has been used in the past in Southeast Asia to support uh, regimes in their, in their fight against, um, against other kinds of groups. We can link it with environmental insecurities, obviously. Uh, illegal illegal uh, logging takes place in the world's most vulnerable forests anyway. The two obviously go, uh, go hand in hand. Uh, the illegal trade in wildlife obviously has an impact on endangerment of species. Uh, it affects habitats, contributes to the loss of biodiversity, and of course it destroys wildlife assets as well. And again, we can look at, say, the impact on tiger populations in Southeast Asia, for example. Um, we can talk, look at um, uh, the growing impact on Southeast Asian pangolin and Chinese pangolin, because African pangolin markets are, are now almost exhausted. And we can also look at economic insecurity. The economic insecurity um, and the APEC economic leaders um, uh, declaration in 2013 talks very specifically about the negative economic implications of environmental crime. It's not just the value and the cost uh, of these of these items, um, but also that the effectively the funds are diverted away from the legitimate economy. Um, the Ill illicit economy actually starts to crowd out. Uh, the legitimate econ economy and distorts markets. And then there's a human security dimension as well that, that I can, we can talk about perhaps in question time. Non-state actors. First, there is the, the, the criminal dimension. This is a problem because we often just, people just talk about smugglers or traffickers. I'm really interested, and this is where it links with Helen's work, I'm really interested in understanding uh, um, transnational criminal networks, actually as a production networks and as supply chains. And therefore, instead of actually saying, talking just simply about smugglers and traffickers as agents of criminality, we actually break this down into extraction crimes, transportation crimes, production crimes, enabling crimes and profit related crimes, and then actually try to identify specific kinds of actors, rather than simply criminalizing everybody that is involved in, um, in this kind of uh, practice farmers who are taking one or two pangolin from the wild uh, are not in the same category of, of criminality as those who are actually managing the trafficking. And then, and then finally, in sort of the last minute or two, uh, NGOs as agents of security. This is not normally how we think about non-governmental organisations uh, in environmental contexts. We normally think about them in advocacy. Um, or politics of resistance kind of processes. But in Southeast Asia, Asia and the Pacific more generally, non-governmental organisations, key NGOs, are really involved in the kind of law enforcement and intelligence gathering activities that we normally think of as being the responsibility of, of the state. So it's not just about their technical expertise and their expert knowledge, but they are actually contributing to surveillance, uh, to policing, to intelligence gathering, as well as to training and, and capacity building, sometimes in conjunction with governments, but actually sometimes undertaking um, 
very successful uh, intelligence gathering, surveillance and operational activities themselves. So again, it goes back really to Helen's point in a different context, those complexities of interaction. But I think it's really interesting to think about non-governmental organisations as agents of security and the ways in which they work in independently and also the ways in which they work as equal partners with states and intergovernmental organisations. I'm going to draw a line there and hopefully that will open up some, some interesting topics for, for conversation later. Thank you so much, Lorraine. And, and th th thank you both, Lorraine and Helen, for, for sticking so beautifully to time. I know it's really hard because you're speaking, both speaking out of vast bodies of knowledge and work um, that you've done. So thank you for doing that uh, so succinctly. Um, and Lorraine, this is fascinating, right, because of the connections that you're already drawing across um, both your sets of remarks, um, Lorraine's and, and, and Helen's. Uh, so three things struck me um, from, from your uh, short remarks. You know, one is the reminder about the enduring interest that we have in securitization processes, right? Uh, but also the amount of, of room for investigation that remains, right, um, of that vital process um, for an issue that I think is relatively understudied, such as tra transnational environmental crime. And, you know, your, your remarks about threat financing particularly, you know, made me think of that older issue of blood diamonds, right? Again, the ethical um, uh, demand markets sort of connection there. Um, and it is news to me that timber trafficking is, is by value such a large item in, in the region. Um, so that's something that perhaps others might like to pick up on in a question and answer. So, second reminder of, again, that those connections are, are your points about the purveyors of insecurity in this realm um, and that need in some ways to think of them not just as networks, but actually as you know, multiple different segments of this global supply chains in, in some ways. Um, and that, again, to me, is a very helpful framework for thinking through because transnational crime is not a lump activity, right? Um, I think it's the point you're trying to make. Um, and finally, you know, the, the, your last point there, emphasizing NGOs as agents of security, again, hearts to Helen's work as well on that notion of the rise of trans, you know, bodies of transnational actors as, as nodes of authority in global um, affairs and global governance, I think is, you know, this, this cast NGOs, as you say, in, in a different light than how we've grown a bit used to seeing them as a bit of a subaltern force, you know, in, in, in global affairs. So thank you for those reminders. And those are some ways in which we may want to open up this conversation. Let me, let us turn to, to Pichamon, please, um, and, um, and open this conversation up a bit more and delve in perhaps more deeply into a couple of things that may intersect as well. Pichamon, please. Thank you very much, Evelyn, and again, thank you for the invitation to be part of this really uh, fascinating panel. Um, I have to say, when I first kind of was started to think about the question, what's so special about Asian security, um, it actually led to some sleepless nights um, and also some very vivid dreams, um, which I think is, is uh, presenting itself through some deja vus as I'm listening to both uh, Lorraine and Helen. Um, so the way I've, I've structured my remarks is I, I really would like to center on three trigger points um, that I think will hope resonate with some of what um, Lorraine and Helen have already said, but which also are very much um, taken from my own observations of the literature, um, as well as from my own research. So the first point I want to make is that, and at the risk of overgeneralizing here, um, I think in Asia, security cannot and should not be understood solely in a top-down manner. I think what we see in the region is a plethora of non-traditional security issues, um, and these really encapsulate the multi-scalar, intersectional, and contextually contingent nature of security understandings as well as issues in the region. Um, and so for this reason, I'd argue that any study of security needs to be informed by lived experiences, by people's lived experiences. Um, and to give you an example of this, so in the research I've been uh, reading but also doing myself on Chinese investment in Southeast Asia. Of course, a lot of it centers on debt trap diplomacy, concerns about how Chinese investment might jeopardize national security, um, critical infrastructure and so forth. But 
what often is missing in such literature is actually an appreciation of how Chinese investment impacts the security felt by individuals at that level on an everyday basis. And this is what I personally find really interesting because it's, it means taking human security into the everyday domain and to realize that you know when you go to a country like Cambodia it's easy for us to say that it's you know um that it's uh what's the word it's very much a um a stronghold for chinese influence or that cambodia is a uh what's a proxy of 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 the chinese state somehow but when you actually go into phnom penh or into rural areas to batambang for instance the realities are are different and there is nuance that we need to capture through a much more um, nuanced, expanded, and grounded understanding of security and how that plays out in people's everyday lives. Related to that point, um, my second point is touches more on, on what it means to do research on culturally and politically sensitive issues in hard places. Um, and of course, for myself, I work on China and Southeast Asia, and I've intentionally <laughs> focused on countries in Southeast Asia where um, there is a high level of state restrictiveness, where governments might not always be welcoming of researchers coming in and asking probing questions, um, but also on issues where there are a range of, of sensitivities, um, whether they be ethnic, um, along ethnic, cultural, social, or, or other lines. Um, and you know, again, the, the challenges that one faces researching such issues um, has to do a lot with getting access to verifiable data. Um, but I also think fundamentally it's also about facing one, one's own presumptions and assumptions about the status quo in these countries, in these contexts. Um, for example, there is a tendency I found in studies on China and Southeast Asia, and again, I'm generalizing a bit here, so I apologize. But I do think that it's a, it's a valid point to make that in a lot of these studies, governments tend to be treated as the bad actors and NGOs, for example, as the good actors, right? So the ones that are uh, driving positive um, forces of change, whereas the governments are the ones that are entrenching corruption, um, perpetuating injustice and so forth. That's not wrong, um, but it's also the case that that's not always the case. And so for that reason, security or insecurity doesn't look the same in every single issue area across or and is not interpreted in the same way by every um, actor uh, in this very diverse region. And so for that reason, the point I wanted to make here is that we need to recognize um, the distinctiveness of the political ecosystems that we see within this region, but we also need to be self reflexive and not to essentialize. So yes, Asian security is special, but it's also not that special right um, and so it's not an easy process, of course, to, to question your personal assumptions, as well as the assumptions um, that are often made within the literature, especially uh, English language literature. But I do think that it's necessary if we really want to get at this notion of, of what's so special about Asian security. Um, but how does security play out, um, again, in people's lived experiences? Um, so to give you um, another example of this, um, recently I've been looking at how, um, the, you know, how state authority is challenged or not challenged by non-state actors. And this goes back to my work on you know, how are Chinese investors regulated or not regulated um, by both formal and informal uh, regulatory mechanisms. Um, and what I found is, of course, again, we tend to think of non-state actors as challenging, right? The, uh, the authority of the state as pushing the confines of, of um, the states, uh, of their ability to navigate within high levels of state restrictiveness and so forth. But in actual fact, you also see cases where such non-state actors are helping to um, entrench state authority and control, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Um, and again, in my own research, I've been seeing some evidence of this come through from the practices of some Chinese NGOs, um, as well as from Chinese state-owned enterprises and uh, private enterprises operating overseas in the infrastructure and energy sectors. Um, another assumption that I think we need to try and counter as well, and one that um, both Helen and Lorraine have made, um, is that in when we look at uh, security issues in Southeast Asia or in China, we tend to assume that there is a there are weak actors and there are strong actors. And again, that's not wrong. Um, but it does vary depending on the context. And so weak actors are not always weak. 
Um, and we're certainly seeing this increasingly um, in the case of Southeast Asia, where protests have become um, often a tool used by what are normally viewed as weaker actors um, to call for a greater accountability or transparency. And we can debate to what extent they're successful, but the fact remains that you know, those that we have traditionally viewed as weak are actually increasingly exerting their own authority vis-a-vis -vis the state, vis-a-vis -vis other um, established um, actors. And for that reason, these are the assumptions that we really need to uh, progressively and constantly challenge. And so related to that as well, and this is to kind of end my remarks on a slightly more methodological note, um, a word that always scares me personally <laughs> when um, studying uh, security in this region. But I think when it comes to scholarship on Asian security and politics more broadly, power dynamics will tend to feature prominently in the subject matter or case studies that we look at, as well as in how we conduct the research itself. And I think this is a point that we don't always, as researchers, that we don't always um, contemplate enough about. Um, and the point I'm trying to make here is one about epistemic exploitation. Um, and epistemic exploitation is basically my way of saying that uh, when we do research on such sensitive security related issues, we ourselves as researchers might in some way be contributing to the insecurity experienced by those that we study. Um, and certainly this is not a problem that's unique to scholarship on Southeast Asia or in China, but it is one that is nonetheless prevalent um, as certain actors are more frequently accessed by researchers and are consequently able to participate to a greater degree in the generation of social meanings. And I think this is something that we need to interrogate, we need to be mindful about, and we need to push back on. Um, and again, I think the work that Helen and Lorraine are doing are exceptionally important in that regard, because it is about spotlighting actors that are less frequently studied and less um, well understood, um, but also uh, challenging how these meanings are, are being created and how securitization is happening uh, within these domains. Um, and the inspiration behind this, this kind of final trigger, trigger point um, came from the work that I recently have been doing on environmental human rights defenders in Southeast Asia. Um, and in one conversation um, that I had with a, um, a civil society actor, the complaint that they kind of raised to me was the fact that researchers come in, uh, they ask lots of probing questions, they go away with the information and they never hear back from them ever again. Of course, we have ethics processes at the university level to supposedly deal with such issues, but they're not really strictly enforced, are they? Um, at the same time, it's also the case that when you ask, when, once you've built trust, um, it's also about asking questions that won't put your interviewee at risk, even if it means that you're going to get really great resources or material or data for your own research. Um, that may mean that you get to publish in a great outlet like international security or so forth. Um, and so I think what is really needed here um, is, and there are no perfect solutions, to be honest, when it comes to trying to enhance epistemic justice. Uh, but I think participatory action research is one way. Um, I don't think the methodological tools for PAR are quite there yet, but I think the rationale behind it, the reason that you're for this uh, kind of methodological toolkit is there. And um, it's one way to, as from my perspective, to bridge problem solving um, and more theoretical research in a way that we are constantly uh, thinking about what our research means to those that we study and how our research can actually contribute to um, mitigating some of those insecurities that we see in the region that we so very much care about, um, but which I think we all should aspire to contributing to not only at the academic level, but equally at the policy and social levels as well. But I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, May. Um, that, that's caused me to pause um, and, and think quite hard. Um, and and I, I suspect you, you've had the same effect on, on, mo on most of our audience. Um, so th thank you for those really, really timely reminders um, that security is not just a top-down issue, which particularly as a strategic studies international relations scholar, I'm prone to thinking that way, I'll admit. Um, and, and, you know, in, in May's case, uh, you know, her arguments about human security as, as a lived everyday reality come right out of the work that she does. And I, I know that she has 
sort of immerse herself in, in, in multiple uh, types of regional um, communities and actors in the environmental areas and in the, in the women's um, issues, also in labor rights and so on and so forth. So it does come out of uh, that kind of direct um, uh, research experience. And, you know, really your reminder at the same time about the, the ethical dimensions of doing research of the kinds that we're talking about here, um, also extremely timely and such a powerful counterpoint, right, to what so many of us struggle with when continually asked about the policy relevance of um, our research. Perhaps we really ought to be thinking of more primarily about the impacts and the relevance of our research for the communities um, of lived reality that, that our research touches upon. So thank you for those uh, really, really important reminders. And, and uh, we'll, we'll open this up um, uh, so that we can think about this collectively. Um, perhaps I can first um, invite the three speakers, uh, just in case you have any immediate responses to what you've each said. Um, please just nod or shake your heads to me and so I know, please take a bit more time. Okay, you're good. Okay, in that case, then let me turn to some of the questions and as you sort of digest this, the speakers will have priority if you have anything that you want to say in response to each other as well as to the questions, okay? Um, I have a question from Amy King. Um, I'm going to let Amy ask it herself, if that's okay, Amy. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and thank you so much to Helen, Lorraine and Pichamon. Um, each of your remarks sort of together made me sort of think about this question, which is probably not very articulate right now, but let me, let me give it a go. I mean, I think we're living in a moment in which, um, as, as Pichamon mentioned, so much of the literature, but also the response of many states is to almost take us back to an older, more traditional state-based top-down approach to thinking about so many of the issues that you study. So we see the framing of development standards or the framing of trade and you know, ethical labor standards. Or I, I assume also that the framing of issues like transnational environmental crime through a very state-based you know, uh, power dynamic kind of realist um, framing. And which is obviously, there are reasons for that. And, you know, some, some of that is just the, the, the response of particular literatures. Some of it though, I think is because we are living in a moment of, you know, power, power transition or order transition um, and kind of a return to that more, some of those more traditional security threats. And I, I guess my question is partly about how we study that without reverting to the methodological nationalism that Helen spoke of. Um, is it just about add or adding a further layer? Um, and, you know, as, you, as, as I think Helen suggested, sort of treating the state as yet another site of authority. Um, or are there, are there other, you know, creative ways uh, that we can actually kind of bring those perspectives together? Or is that just too much to hope for? You know, is it, is it that we just need to accept um, lots of, you know, lots of contributions by different scholars taking, for example, Pichimon's everyday human security based on the ground um, perspective on Chinese investments in Cambodia, for example? Um, or are there, are, are there ways that we can actually bring in um, both you know, both the state and uh, and the multiple sites of authority, uh, the the production networks, um, or, or whatever you know, whatever the, the relevant um, approach is in, in in the issue area. I feel like this is a, a particularly critical moment, um, uh, both you know from a real world policy point of view, uh, or from a community point of view, as well as sort of from the literature's point of view, um, to sort of to to kind of not have those literatures move further further apart from one another. Thank you. Would, um, would anyone like to respond to Amy's typically challenging question? <laughs> Not a criticism, Amy. <laughs> uh, Lorraine, please. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start and have a, have a go at this because I, I think in some ways Amy's question goes to the heart of what it's always meant to study and research non-traditional security. Because in a way that 
that that it's not even a duality. I mean, that complexity of whose voices even get to be heard about the ways in which security is articulated as a research topic, but also as uh, as a policy initiative. I, I think if you've been working in non-traditional security, that's always been a challenge. Uh, so I, I, I perhaps make just a couple of points. I don't. I have to say, I don't think I have an answer to your question, but it's probably more. Um, it's partly drawing on on what um, Pishmon May has, has already talked about, um, and 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 that is, I think, it's kind of pushing back against that kind of um, epistemic hegemony. I think that's the first thing. So that even when uh, issues are articulated through a particularly status lens, then I think as scholars, one of the things we can do is 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 unpack that and expose that. In the transnational environmental crime issue, for example, one of the things that I've I've written on is, and I'm not the only person, obviously, writing on this, is is fighting back um, against what what some scholars have called kind of this Clausewitzian um, model of of transnational envir environmental crime, uh, uh, threat conflict, uh, threat finance, etc. It's the same in the climate security literature. I'm I'm constantly kind of trying to pull the rug under people who go, climate change is a threat multiplier, and there's going to be billions of people on the move. You know, there's, I mean, there's there's no evidence for that, and you only have to talk to demographers about that. So, so I've I've also written about well, you know, if we securitize these aspects of of climate of of, of transnational environmental crime, what does the militarization of co of conservation look like? So I think there's that. I think the second thing is that um, is that we work in interdisciplinary spaces. Uh, so, for example, the climate the climate change example that I just gave, we start to talk to demographers or people who who have actually been doing on the ground research about say people movements in the Pacific or um, or in Southeast Asia, you get a very different image of of what what the what the framing conditions um, are, if you like. Um, and and I think the third thing is that it, it arises partly from what we think our responsibilities as scholars are. Is it just simply to engage in those, uh, if you like, epistemic debates, bringing in you know the subaltern voices, as as Evelyn has pointed. Or, or how do we take those different kinds of perspectives back into that more orthodox community? So how do we take the heterodoxies into the orthodoxies? Um, and sometimes that can be a little bit challenging. I've, I've been at inter Interpol meetings, for example, where I'm surrounded by, um, uh, you know, um, enforcement officers and, uh, and those who are doing sort of surveillance, etc. And when you say, well, actually, could we just step back from this and think that perhaps this is not the only way of looking at it? Um, so, so I think there's also a question about how, how do we actually, who do we talk to about our research and how do we actually try to, to insert and tweak and just destabilise in various kinds of ways? Um, th thanks for that, Lorraine. H uh, Helen's got a response as well. Uh, yeah, I'll have a go as well. It's a great question. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I have bits and pieces. Uh, but one way of, I mean, what's been happening is that we kind of take a state centric perspective right from the start for any issue area. And I've been reading, you know, some of these authors, uh, Corey and Alan, who talk about starting with the governance object or the object of governance. You know, and then look at who is involved in saying what, doing what, including the, the least powerful and so on, and then tracing, uh, you know, those things, as Pichamon has, has just said. And the second, uh, I think, point is that we tend to look at outcomes. Uh, and I found this uh, rather than process. Uh, I know this is a very ASEAN thing, you know, uh, process matters, outcome doesn't. So it becomes a bad word in ASEAN. But, you know, when I look at, you know, what I've been studying, uh, Evelyn, as you said, transnational governance of palm oil, I actually find that uh, these uh, NGO corporate uh, schemes, they have made some difference uh, and they have some of the most comprehensive standards. But uh, what's happening is uh, it's easy to dismiss because every, sing 
you know, even one act of a corporate transgression becomes, uh, you know, exaggerated as the industry as a whole is unsustainable, nothing can be done and, uh, and so on. So, you know, it's the processes that I find that have led us to where we are today, where the state's actually moving to try to do something, whether or not they're doing it, you know, right, uh, and just, you know, heading back to old ways of behaving is a different question but it has come to this tipping point because of all of these processes that have gone in but then you do get you know uh, scholars who say that you know if you look at outcomes non-state actors don't matter it's big powers if they agree then we go forward so that's a second sort of point and my third point goes to what uh Pichamon just said about don't essentialize you know, uh, states are not always bad, NGOs are not always good. And I would like to add that, you know, uh, there's been a tendency in the work that I do to sort of um, see corporate sector and businesses as evil. Uh, I mean, you know, they are, uh, there are, I mean, corporations also are, you know, acting on their interests. And it may be in the, it is in their interest to actually embrace these standards. Doesn't matter whether they, they've internalized them and so on, but they do and have moved on this. So, and some of them, especially those facing global markets are uh, very responsive and, you know, engaged in making huge changes uh, domestically. Some know, but, you see, again, this is the essentializing that I think, uh, you know, we, we come to it with either a particular perspective uh, or a Marxist perspective or a critical perspective. And so it, it, I guess it's all those choices we make, as, as Maya said, you know, at the start of our research. So. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, May. Thank you. No, um, listening to both Lorraine and Helen has given me inspiration, um, as well as Hope and Amy again. Great question. And I feel like this is a question that we'll probably be, still be asking in about 10 years time. Um, I'm not too sure whether it will ever be resolved um, in the sense that I feel like part of it is really about, as Lorraine was saying, the epistemic hegemony that we see um, when it comes to certain approaches, certain viewpoints, uh, certain concepts. Um, and I think this is where, again, I'd like to make a kind of a, a little push for problem solving research in the sense that you know, when we go into a PhD program, we're trained to think about the puzzle, whether it be an empirical puzzle, a theoretical puzzle, so forth. But I think it's also important to embed within those kind of reflections on the puzzle, what it actually means for the real world, for the subjects that we are studying as well. Um, and there's a tendency I found like when you read a uh, scholarship by people based within these communities, if you look at the community based research reports that come from them, there's a tendency for us as academics to say these are too descriptive. They're not academically rigorous enough and so forth. And that in itself is, you know, it's fair, but it's also a bit of a barrier, right, in terms of um, diversifying the academic um, landscape, but also to introduce these new ideas um, and ensure that the old and the new kind of mix and intermingle. So I, I don't really have solutions, but I think in one sense it starts with us as individuals as much as it does with the field itself. Um, and so long as we continue to cleave to, you know, the theories that we have been trained to, to look to when we're seeking to make sense of the world, I think that will continue to be, in one sense, a barrier to how we also interpret and experience the world. Um, so there may well be a case there for actually just going into the field first, seeing what's out there before we impose the theoretical concepts um, that will consequently bind us. Uh, thank you, May. I, I think that's a that's a really valuable reminder of you know the, the need to be sort of very self-reflective about what our primary purpose is as as scholars. And I think this is so far a conversation mainly amongst amongst scholars from a sort of you know that perspective. And you know, as as the three of you were adding these insights to the conversation in response to Amy, I thought of two books, right, um, which I like to teach together. And this is such an old debate. But I like to teach Susan Strange, States and Markets, together with Barry Buzan's People, States and Fear. Because I think those two already very old books, 1977, 1983, you know, um, are sort of, you know, the, those linchpins of this conversation that we're having. 
kind of, you know, Susan Strange observed in the 70s that, excuse me, is no longer about states alone. When we think about global affairs or global governance, um, markets, you know, economic actors, it constantly astounds me that, you know, there remain bulwarks in the field who think that we can do international affairs and just think about military security without knowing anything about economics. It astounds me. Um, and Barry Buzan's People, States and Fear was one of the earliest works that essentially made this point about if we can see the security, you know, as, a, as something that not just encompasses threats, but actually encompasses vulnerability, right, at a variety of levels, including people that May was talking about, but especially people. Um, then there's no escape from this much more holistic kind of lens that's, that's necessary, right, to, to, to approach it these issues. And I was going to um, offer, you know, mount a little bit more of a challenge to our three speakers, following on from Amy's question, but also following on from a question that Bill's put um, bilaterally to me in, in, in the chat box. Thanks, Bill, for, for um, those really useful comments. Um, you know, I, I think there's a bit of a tension here, and there always has been, right, for those of us who work on non-traditional security and non-state actors, always that tension of show me the significance, right? So what, right? Um, again, you know, Helen, Lorraine and I were involved in the non-traditional security revolution in Southeast Asia, right, about 20 years ago. And, you know, do you remember that phase when we all decided that we had to bring these issues into the security realm by showing how they could actually lead to conflict, right? That, that used to be how we would justify why one had to look at non-traditional security. Okay, so I'm going to, issue this challenge to our three speakers. And I'd like you to address this challenge head on, right? The so what question. So Bill usefully reminds me that with, with a quote here that, you know, Samantha Powell, sorry, not Powell, Samantha Power um, is, is, is claimed to have made the remark that, you know, the US aid budget of 25 billion could buy the entire, you know, organized crime ecosystem wholesale. Well, okay, I, I'm just, I, I'm not, you know, legitimizing that. I'm just reading from, from Bill's um, um, uh, comments to me. Um, and, you know, in, in that sort of context, you know, I read this as, as this challenge of, you know, what, why should we care about this sort of thing, right? Um, I, I'd suggest, I guess, a couple of things. Um, maybe we want to return to that, that old model that I, I just talked about. Or I'd actually prefer you, if you like, to give us an example from your work right, that, that shows, right, why the arenas that you've talked about, just one good example, briefly, you know, that, that shows why we should care, why it's significant, maybe not in money terms, but in security and vulnerability and people terms, right, um, or maybe give us a different signifier, right, our signifier used to be this could lead to interstate war, that used to be the signifier, I don't think that that's the only signifier, but if that were not the signifier, what would it be, right, for your areas of study? This, this is my challenge to you. I'm sorry to, to put you on the spot like that, but I think we need to address this one head on. Who'd like to have a go first? <laughs> Shall I try again? Okay, I think I've lost you, Evelyn. You no, ready? please do, please do. Thank you. Um, Bill always asks the so what question. Uh, so let me make a preliminary observation about the so what question and how we answer it, because I think it goes back to the conversation that we've just had. One of the issues is that the so what question is often actually phrased in status terms. So there's, there's an aspect in which we, we can actually say, I can't answer the so what question because I won't answer it in status terms, therefore you won't accept my answer. So, so I think there's that, there's that dimension of it. I can make an argument, uh, and I've, I've introduced some of the concepts about why I think we, we can uh, um, make those connections to more orthodox views of state security um, and the links with transnational environmental crime. So that can be done. 
um, we can make an argument through economic security. So for example, um, the loss of revenue and tax and excise to the Indonesian government um, as a result of uh, illegal logging and timber trafficking is estimated, and uh, I don't have the figures to hand, but it's estimated to be something around about the, you know, the equivalent of the aid budget that goes to Indonesia per year. Okay, so there's a, there's a real, it also depresses the market. So, so the, the market in stolen timber depresses the glo global timber prices by something like about six to, six to 10%. Okay, so we can say, well, okay, if you happen to be in the legal timber industry, there's your so what concern. I think that the so what concern is we should care about this because we should care about the impact on ecosystems. We should care about endangerment of species. We should care about the impacts that sometimes the violence and the control and the human rights abuses that come with these kinds of illegal harvesting and extraction impose on local communities. Okay, so, so we should care about that. We should care about that in a number of reasons. We should care about that because it's ethically right for us to care about those things. We should also care about that because in all kinds of ways, um, you know, when we think about transnational environmental crime, we're always thinking about charismatic megafauna. We think about great apes and, and big cats and elephants and rhinos and, and great apes. Um, but actually, we don't think about plants. We think a little bit about high-end trees like rosewood mahogany. Um, uh, but, but actually, you know, it, it's that whole argument that Thomas Poggy's argument about, about the fact that directly or indirectly, we, we benefit from things like um, global poverty, that, that the systemic structures actually um, lead us to a, an advantage that we effectively, if you like, don't deserve. We can, it's a bit complex argument. And I would say we should also care because somehow um, by benefiting from some of these um, forms of illegal and illicit economies, which are incredibly complex globally, we, you know, we're not directly complicit, but we might have a, a, a degree of benefit from it that we should be concerned about. But I know that those answers don't actually persuade somebody who, and I'm not saying Bill won't be persuaded, um, we can talk about Bill, you and I can talk about this later. Uh, the other thing I just want to come back to is who, where do we find these arguments about, go back to, as you pointed out, Evelyn, about, say, linking this to conflict. One of the things that I've, I've struggled with is that some of those debates about, about linking uh, illegal wildlife trade, timber trafficking and others to conflict and the threat multiplier, it's also coming out of the NGO community. And so I have, an, I have a, um, a, a paper in front of me, The Global Security Implications of the Illegal Wildlife Trade, which talks specifically about the ways in which um, you know, income from poaching helps fund violent activities by state and non-state actors. The data isn't questioned. There, there's no reflection on their own analysis. It's being done for strategic reasons, and I understand it, but it actually complicates the the ways in which we're actually trying to push back against these kinds of things. So sorry, that was a slightly longer hmm. answer. No, it's, um, yeah, I, I, the economic basis, the ecological basis, the people basis, and fundamentally the ethical basis um, are, are your signifiers. I think that's, that's clear, Lorraine. Um, would, would Helen or, or uh, Pitchmon like to weigh in at, at this point? Or I can introduce an interlude while you think about it with another question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can answer your question. Okay. Yes, get a please. Pass. yes please. Uh, yeah, well, it's just, um, I agree with uh, uh, the point that uh, Lorraine made and your point about, you know, these are the economic signifiers, the ethical signifiers and so on. Um, I guess it, this is how I came to this research. Uh, if states are not doing, this is my question, if states are not doing anything about deforestation or land rights, uh, and this was way back about 10 years ago, who else can or will, especially if states had the authority to dismiss NGOs, to repress uh, internal, you know, uh, civil society activists, you know, to um, 
close off debate and so on. Was there a way that this could take place without having to get the permission or the consent of states? And that led me to, to the market, uh, to using the market to, um, to, to, to draw these standards. These are market-based standards. They're not perfect. I, I fully accept that. They're not perfect. They're voluntary. And you have swaths of the industry that don't comply. But it is a first step. And it has shown us through a lot of work, including uh, things like uh, scientific research. I mean, we often forget about the, the very simple act of collecting knowledge and developing field knowledge in a way that, uh, you know, a, that, that, that helps local communities as well, for instance. I mean, everyone forgets that smallholders are part of, uh, you know, 50% or 40% uh, of uh, palm oil production is through smallholders, and they've actually been left sort of hanging to dry out there by the state that has not uh, continued the sort of technical support and extension work that was done in the 1700s and 80s. It just left them out there. And what's happened is because, again, of the interest of large firms in making sure that their smallholder suppliers are also regarded as sustainable, otherwise they get locked out of the, the global market, they have had to take on uh, a development role. This is, uh, you know, going back to uh, Lorraine's work uh, about NGOs as purveyors of security. Here you have corporations and NGOs as purveyors of development doing the kind of development work that states used to do in the 70s and 80s, uh, but it's not scalable. So, you know, there are limits. Uh, so I guess this is where I'm coming from and this, the so what. And, the, and the, the other part is that, you know, I think you have to trace the process. Uh, I don't think a so what can be answered by an outcome uh, because the, it, it, it adds up and then you get a tipping point. Thanks very much, Helen. I'm going to turn to May briefly and then I have questions from Alice Barr and Margaret Jolly coming up. Sure. I'm going to say that I agree with both Lorraine and Helen, so I won't re reiterate what they've already said. I think the so what question depends on the project as well, what the purpose of what it is you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve. For me, the so what question that drives my research to give an example, as Evelyn was asking, is going to a, um, a rural community in Laos. Uh, the point was made about how Chinese investment projects have created pockets of poverty, um, but also pockets where you see the emergence of brothels, of human, potentially human trafficking and so forth, as well as wildlife smuggling and trafficking as well. And to me, that is the so what question. It matters because this is what people are living, are experiencing. Um, and obviously it's not good. Um, and we want to find solutions to that, or at least to understand the problem. Um, so for me, that's the so what question. And in part, it's also the bit about how, you know, Samantha Power, of course, she's important um, in certain domains, but to the people I speak with, she doesn't really matter. Um, what matters to them looks very different um, to what matters to other people. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, May. And um, I'll turn to, I'll give the floor to Alice. Alice Barr? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, I really appreciated this discussion, partly because it also um, helps me think through some things, which is also some of my questions as well. Um, I also like the point that Pichamon makes about how we might try to bridge the practical policy and the academic roles that we have. Um, and the point that both she and Lorraine just made about, you know, need to think more bottom up about our questions and concepts. I think this is something that we all kind of grapple with also as teachers um, and uh, as well as as researchers. I have two practical kinds of questions. Um, my first is that, you know, I've been grappling myself with how best to study complex systems. And so um, I very much appreciated, especially I think Helen's discussion here, but I'd be interested in hearing more from each of you. Um, so, you know, um, and so for example, um, I wonder if any of you could elaborate a little bit more on the approaches that you found especially useful in trying to study complex systems, you know, with multiple moving parts? That's my first question. Um, and then the second is also a practical question, and that has to do with the difficulties of responding from a very practical sense to complexity in complex systems in ways beyond the tactical, right, as Helen put it. You know, I've seen some discussions in the Singapore context, but I'd be interested in your elaborating on examples of other responses um, that you've seen that 
um, you know, take more of a holistic or more beyond tactical approach. You know, governments rely on technical responses partly because it's easier practically and politically, it seems to me. Um, you know, I guess um, not to go on too long, but Helen's work on palm oil governance might be one example, but I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more. Um, and especially, you know, to the extent that we're, we also want to not assume top down approaches, but it does seem that some degree of coordination is also necessary. Um, and so, you know, who else can or will, I think, as Helen just put it in her last comments. So those are my, my questions. Um, uh, thank you very much, Alice. Now, because we're we're pushing up against time a bit, I'm I'm going to, um, if the speakers are okay with this, uh, take Margaret's question as well, um, so that we can perhaps think about these things together. Margaret, if you're happy to, yeah, thanks, Evelyn. Yeah. That's fine. And um, I'm coming at this, you know, I suppose not having been in this uh, debate. Thank you so much uh, for the panelists. Really fascinating discussion. I wanted to sort of return to the questions about why security. And these processes of the discursive securitization, I suppose, of a whole range of issues. And I suppose, I mean, this is a question that Amy raised, uh, but Helen, uh, sorry, um, Lorraine was also talking about the heterodox in relationship to the orthodox. And I suppose what, you know, my perception really as an outsider to these debates is that there is this kind of um, way in which what was the heterodox, human security, non traditional security, risks kind of those processes of over securitization of problems that could be framed in other terms, not necessarily security terms, like human rights discourse, for example. And I just want to take the case of climate change. I'm actively researching gender and climate change issues in Oceania at the moment. And I think there has been a really significant shift from the 80s and 90s. Um, I mean, this is a shift, you know, uh, particularly in the, in the relationship between feminist movements, environmentalist movements, with the formation of, you know, the UN Convention, the, the IPC, you know, all of the kind of stuff with the intergovernmental panel, you see much more a masculinist, militarist kind of security dimension sort of coming into those debates. Sherilyn McGregor, I think, has, has analysed this quite consummately. And I suppose I just wanted to kind of raise the question, uh, which really relates to these fundamental questions about epistemic violence and, and uh, you know, the violation that we do to some of our research subjects, because I think looking at the kind of climate change um, context in Oceania, you know, there is too much of a pull to kind of bring that just into the kind of geopolitical security questions of Australia, for example, in relationship to rising, you know, Chinese dominance. And some of the absolute kind of human rights and existential issues get sort of evacuated. And there's too much reliance on a kind of discourse of resilience which, you know, following on some of Mark Harden's suggestions, I think, you know, if that resilience is only to be found in communities and not to be found in states and other actors, then really that, that risks in that context, at least, of deflecting the blame for those who are causing the, the, the harms to those who are suffering the harms. So I, I think that there are some really kind of big questions here about how we frame knowledge, you know, why there is a kind of securitization of certain issues and, um, you know, but, you know, at the same time, I'm absolutely, you know, thrilled with this, you know, push back against state centrism and, you know, um, uh, methodological nationalism and, and looking at the complexity of the kinds of systems that you're all engaged in. So just a comment from a bit of an outsider to these debates. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Margaret. But that's a very timely reminder, I think. I mean, again, those of us who, you know, spend a lot of time on securitization, right, uh, have always debated the, the two ends of the utility mm. of the concept. Um, mm. We've asked questions about under securitization, we've asked questions about under what conditions things get securitized, um, but probably yes, it is also important to think about whether over securitization causes mm. you know, a, a, a series of issues in itself. Um, and again, I invite the speakers to, you, you know, to think about these, these two sets of questions um, and, and please, you know, see which bits you, you'd like to, to, to give a response to. Um, and as, as you're thinking about that, please let me know who, who would like to, to have a stab at, at this. Um. <laughs> uh, Helen, is, is that a, I would like to have a stab at it look? Okay, yes. 
actually no I was turning oh, over was paper, but I will have a stab at it okay uh, I, I will respond I'll try to respond to Alice's questions uh, because uh, I actually came to this whole notion of complexity because of what I was discovering in what I was studying, I was going round in circles. So it was changing every day. Uh, and I think that is the difficulty. I, in scholarship, we're always looking for regularities and, and, and you can look, search for them. I think it's, it's valid, but I'm not sure that they will persist. Uh, they, they do keep changing. Um, so how do, uh, and, and this goes back to the question of how do governments respond or states respond beyond the tactical? And actually, I'm not sure because, uh, because the systems are changing so much, the goalposts change uh, all the time. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that I can actually, uh, you know, uh, figure out how they can act more tactically but i guess okay in the case that i just mentioned in my presentation i think the the, the tactical element is quite clear that governments were not prepared to change some of the fundamental ways in which the political economy of agricultural commodities or extraction uh, work so that was very very clear that that is a you know a tactical response so I guess that the, the, and Evelyn has worked on the strategic diplomacy and so on, where you actually look at the problem more holistically and in a long term sense uh, with the capacity to respond. But I think in the case that I mentioned, if you're not respond, if you're only responding to a state centric interest in market access, so you are trying to get the WTO to intervene in the EU case and so on and so forth, you're, you're still going to leave yourself vulnerable and leave people vulnerable as well. And that's going to create other kinds of domestic uh, political sort of resistance or external resistance uh, and so on. I mean, I'll give you an example of a strategic response by the Malaysian government to, you know, the, the concern about, you know, palm oil might not be the major, uh, you know, economic sector anymore. And we have plumped for mineral extraction as the way forward. So we're going to go back to the days of, you know, tin mining, but not tin, bauxite, manganese, gold, coal is on the agenda. So I'm not sure if this is strategic or tactical or what. So I think it also uh, goes back to what Pichamon said. What are we studying? Who are we who is the you know who are we looking at who are we putting at the center of you know our our work and also policy uh, people states and fear people so yeah. i mean it, it reminds me doesn't it helen that again as helen mentioned you know i'm i'm doing a bit of work on this issue of how to deal with complexity both in sort of analysis and in policy uh work and and we have a program going that that teaches at a master's level but also uh, for government. Um, and, you know, one of the key insights, I suppose, that, you know, we, we try to drill down into is how do we connect apparently disparate actors and groups, right, within a system, right? If they're part of the same ecosystem, um, you know, we want to think about their connections and, and the sort of functions or roles, right, that they play within a, an interconnected system, which may not have always be perfectly obvious. And I think connecting this to what we've just been talking about, you know, one way of thinking about it is that we could think that local populations in a Pacific island, you know, are not that important if we weren't particularly interested in, you know, human security. On the other hand, if we see them as a critical node, right, in, in a complex system, which is geared towards, you know, an ecological sustainability, Right. We, as Margaret says, we need local communities to be able, right, to to develop modes of resilience in their day to day life or their livelihoods or their interaction with the human, you know, with the natural environment. There, some of these areas could be like coral reefs, which are absolutely essential, right, uh, for certain low lying islands not to get inundated as the sea level rises and, and so on and so forth. For example, those things can't be protected if, if local communities were not somehow involved in that and, and could make it sustainable. So those local communities become essential nodes in, a, in, in that complex system, you know, and, and have become a signifier in a way that they were not if we didn't think about this in an interconnected way, for example. It's a very quick example I can think of that, that comes out of 
you know, that, that, the, the, the work that we do. There are parallels, all the parallels to this in conservation movements in Africa and so on and so forth, when local uh, communities were brought into um, uh, national parks, for example, because you know, it, it was realized that it was essential that you had to provide livelihoods for local communities, but these could be connected to the conservation enterprises. I'm not saying it was problem free, I'm just saying that was one of those insights. Um, Lorraine and, and Pichamon, can I give you the last words in um, the few minutes? Th thanks very much, Evelyn. Um, very quick response first to, to, to Margaret's question. Again, this, is always, this has always been a challenge for people working, say, in the areas of human security. Um, about about not just the terminology, but but what the terminology, what what weight the terminology has, and how this is conveyed. And I very much take your points about the way in which this does lead to kind of a masculinist um, discourse. And you know that those debates have in, indeed been around for a, a, a long time. Uh, and and I'm I'm always anxious about the fact that if I step back from using the term security, then then those who actually have the more orthodox approaches actually take ownership of this. Uh, and we actually have two parallel discussions rather than a, a, a debate. So one of the things I've been writing on, um, in this case about the Mediter Mediterranean um, refugee crisis, but in other contexts as well, is how can we use, how can we take the concept of human security and, and, and make it something different? How can we, in this case, how can we use this to inspire um, it both intellectually but also practically, uh, uh, effectively a cosmopolitan ethic, ethics of dignity and solidarity? So rather than saying, I won't use the term security any longer, I'm going to go, okay, you think you own this? No, you don't. I'm going to be part of that, that pushback. Um, and, I, and I don't like to, I don't use the term subaltern voices because I think then you always have this notion of somehow there's, there's a hierarchy. There's, there are those that control and those that resist. And I'm trying to actually change that calculus. Um, but that's a very personal choice and, and it may speak to those big debates. Uh, the, just a quick point on Alice's. Why does everybody ask such big, complicated questions? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, again, I, look, in the area of transnational environmental crime, it's absolutely the case that the responses rely very much on uh, more on technical responses, because those are in some ways the easier go-to ones. One of the difficulties is that, that those techniques, if you like, take place in different normative spaces. So there are some who would argue that this is actually just an issue of protecting borders. There are some who say this is an issue of a broader trade issue. There are others who say, no, this is an, an environmental issue. So, so we see these, some say it's a law enforcement issue. So we see different kinds of agents pursuing this in different kinds of ways. And so there's kind of this, this normative agential complexity that comes to be part of this as well. In my own research, both in terms of understanding the governance space, but also in terms of understanding the, the nature of, of, of the criminal ecosystem, if you like, so the, the governance ecosystem and the criminal ecosystem, I, I'm actually trying to, to, to say, are there different ways of breaking down complexity? Uh, so, um, and it goes back, I think, very much to, to Helen's point that seeing this as a, as, a, as a governance ecosystem rather than just an institutional ecosystem. So, as I said, on um, I'm, I'm on understanding criminality just rather than just talking about criminal networks, which is actually sometimes meaningless. I'm trying to break this down and say, well, where do points of production happen? Where does labour happen? Where does exploitation happen? And if we know that, then we actually have a much better way of going back into specific cases. And I'm doing a similar kind of thing with the, with the institutional complexity and saying, it doesn't help us to say there's institutional complexity. We know that. How do we, how do we unpack it? How do we characterize it? How do we do with the plausibility probes, to use Ode Klotz's phrase? Um, and how do we actually then come to a, a very different way of understanding complexity rather than just saying we know complexity when we see it let's move on thank you and uh, at, at 12 34 i'm going to get the very last word to me uh, to pitch him on please <laughs> thank you i mean again i can only agree with what's already been said um, and i think you've raised some great examples there evelyn as well 
at the same time, of course, we can't simplify complexity without having first understood that complexity as well. Um, and the challenge with kind of bringing together, uh, connecting all of those disparate um, data points would be, you know, how can we actually make it understandable to a, um, a more diverse audience? Um, and on that note, I think we need to firstly not be afraid of being descriptive. I think there is value in description um, and doing it well um, in a way that is still critical and analytical. Um, at the same time, I think we also need to be mindful of who our audience is. And so to go back to your question, um, Alice, about, you know, the tactical and so forth, um, one point that was made to me just yesterday by one interviewee was that policy planning processes rarely change, um, and it can rarely be changed by external actors. But what can change is the political appetite. Um, and what can change is the acceptability of certain decisions or certain policy pathways. Um, and so I think that's what we need to aspire to in our research, depending on the on the question that we're asking on the problem that we're seeking to solve. Um, again, I don't think I'm providing really concrete um, ways forward here, but for that reason, I think there is perhaps merit in looking at ethnography um, and ethnographic tools when we're trying to make sense of complexity and simplify it in a way that uh, ensures that the data retains its integrity at the same time. Um, again, I'll, I'll stop there because I'm aware we're over time, um, but I'll be more than happy to discuss this further, of course. Thank you so much, uh, Pichmon. And um, please, in this last second, please would you join me in thanking our um, panelists and um, for you know uh, their remarks and for sharing of their research as well as their, their, their experience and their views and actually to encouraging us right to, to think a lot more critically about the issues that many of us work on. Um, thank you so much for, for your time um, uh, Helen, Lorraine and Pichamon. Um, and thank you for join, everyone for joining us um, and giving up your time to be with us in this conversation uh, today. Uh, please, can I encourage you to look at our event um, our website uh, for other resources that, that relate to this discussion as well, including a reading list, which our speakers have recommended um, and would be useful for you in follow up. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you at our next Women in, in uh, Asia Pacific Security Research Seminar Series event in June. More details to follow. Thank you.